Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On May 4th, 1869, the Cincinnati Red Stockings played baseball's first pro game against amateur Great Westerns of Cincinnati. The shellacking they gave them was 45 to 9. Now, 10 months later, a match between Princeton and Rutgers would go down as the first game in intercollegiate football history. For many years, football felt like those amateur Great Westerns had taken a shellacking year after year. But that did not last forever. Because as football became football, it took over as America's favorite sport. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is November 6, 1869, and we're here to witness the first intercollegiate football game, which happened to be between Rutgers and Princeton. 1869 happened to be a big year for sports in general. I mean, there were some other things talking about international cricket games and some other like swimming, racing, polo boats and such. But this was the year that pro baseball was born, as stated in the intro, May 4th, 1869. But the creation of football as uh, getting closer to what we know it is today And pro baseball, at least at the beginning stages, that was not the only thing that was important for the growth of America. You see, we love our baseball, but we love our football more in America now. But back then, they sure loved to travel out west. And to make that easier, six days after pro baseball was born, well, (laughs) they completed the Transcontinental Railroad. This was completed with the ceremonial drive of what was known as the Golden Spike, or the last spike, completing the build of the Transcontinental Railroad in tiny little town over in Utah. But why is this important? Well, I think that America, football, is kind of synonymous. And just as football would start and just continue to expand throughout time, Back in 1869, so did that Transcontinental Railroad. And I'm sure there's tons of stories and great history and other things that were impacted as this railroad would unite the East and the West. We got to talk about football, though. We have this week's guest, Tim Brown. Not that Tim Brown. We're talking about Timothy P. Brown. He wrote a book called How Football Became Football, 150 Years of the Game's Evolution. And just like the evolving transportation routes and all these other things that we have, today's football looked nothing like it did back in the day. Well, at least not close enough to what we would resemble as football. Just like nowadays, how many people really drive the train as their main source of travel from the east to the west? I would go ahead and venture that the percentage of people crossing east to west and vice versa today the percentage is nowhere near as high as it was back in 1860. Well, we'll move it over to 1870s. So just like the railroad wasn't always just there, football was not always just there. It had to be built. And this book gives you an in-depth review of how football became football. And as always, I'm going to go ahead and leave links to the book and some other information in Tim's site in the show notes which you can get to through your podcast player 
or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com, which now takes you over to my page on the Sports History Network, the headquarters for your favorite sports yesteryear. This is a network at the very early stages. So if you yourself know of a podcast that you think should be on the network, or you're starting to you know, get that itch, you want to start your own history podcast or YouTube channel or anything else, well, <laughs> if it's about your favorite sport, team, or league, hit us up on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. But for now, let's get into how football became football. So, I mean, the first thing that really, as I was kind of going through here, I wanted to ask you, what was your inspiration for writing a book about how football became football? Yeah, so, uh, you know, in order to tell you about my second book, I kind of have to tell the story of the first one. So, you know, I mean, I was, uh, I played football, I had a chance to coach when I was in grad school. And so, uh, but then I kind of went into the business world. And my main connection with football was to either coach my kids, attend some games, and then and I collected old Rose Bowl, you know, memorabilia. And so, in the course of collecting, I came across a story that indicated that half the guys who had played in the 1918 Rose Bowl, which was played by military teams, half those guys died in action in World War One or World War Two. So I kind of started looking into that. Turned out it wasn't true, but nevertheless, it was overall a fascinating story. Um, and that's what the first book is about. But in telling that story, as I researched, I found out there, there are just a lot of elements of football from the World War One era that were just different from what I knew, what you know, what I had played and, and been exposed to. And so, I, in order to tell that first the story of the first book, I had to get to know some football history. And some of the feedback I got from the first book was, you know, some of the stuff I liked best was the old football, you know, understanding the background, how the game evolved. Uh, and thankfully it was something that I was very interested in. So I, I just continued, um, I just continued down that path, just found more and more information and, uh, you know, kind of tried to determine how do I, how do I structure this thing? You know, what's interesting, what's, what's interesting to me, what do I think would be interesting to a reader? So essentially what I've tried to do is kind of tell the story of football, <laughs> you know, and it's easy to think that football I mean, I think everybody knows, yeah, it came from rugby, but what does that really mean? H how did that progression occur, right? And and what you know, were there certain key points where the game went in one direction or another? And you know, who did that? Who was involved? Yeah, that's something that I can tell you. So I played football myself, and I just always took everything for granted. I grew up um, you know, Barry Sanders fan. I, <laughs> I've talked about this tons of times on my show. I'm a Detroit Lions diehard, probably to a fault, anyways, and as far as I was concerned, the whole Barry Sanders in the 90s era, like that just was football. And I just never contemplated, well, they didn't throw the ball back in the day. They didn't have all these other types of rules. So it's kind of cool that when I started the show, I was able to go back and talk about Walter Camp. But then even further back is what your your book even starts at. So speaking of Fields of Friendly Strife, you have a website for that as well, right? That's right. And and I, uh, I, I'm kind of re rehabbing it, if you will. Uh, so that site was really geared towards the first book, uh, but I it's been then drifting more and more to the football history. Um, I'm actually so I'm actually kind of rehabbing it, restructuring it right now. I may actually rename it and move it to a different domain, but anyways, at this point, it's fieldsoffriendlystrife.com. Is that going to be where it's uh, a lot of information from this book that the fans can kind of get a little bit of a taste, and then they can go and purchase the book thereafter? Yeah, so there's probably. Um, half a dozen articles that are purely football history, you know, kind of looking at the evolution of particular elements of the game. And then there's a bunch of other articles that are really about this, this team or, you know, uh, some, some more specific element of, of the game. Um, so probably two thirds of the content on the site now is football oriented. And then the other th third is more world war one and, uh, you know, some of what happened uh, during the war. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, they both tie together definitely because of um, when we had um, 
Chris Serb on, oh, geez, I don't know, a couple months ago or something like that. And he had a lot of interesting stories that I had never known how football and World War One were connected. Yeah, so, you know, Chris, uh, Chris you know, I took a more uh, a more narrow path. I focused on on two sets of teams that and then, you know, kind of that was the focus of my book. And, and then I talked about kind of the world and the war in 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 general. Chris took a more of a survey approach, looking at all the te- all the military teams at the time. So you know, mine was kind of more in depth on thir- certain teams. His was you know broader, uh, and he focused more on kind of what the implications were of those teams or of service football uh, for the early NFL. Yeah, and so then when you came to this next book, how football was football. Um, basically, you need an offensive lineman to be able to pick it up because of how girthy this thing is. I mean, there's a lot of knowledge in here that the uh, fans of the show will be able to go over. And I know we're only going to cover just a very little bit. But uh, speaking of that, it was broken up into three parts. I saw. Why did you choose those specific three parts? So, uh, you know, there's a lot of information to try to cover, and so one of the challenges was how do I structure this in a way. If I just went chronologically, if I just said, okay, in 1877, here's what happened. And in 1878, this is what happened. I just didn't think that could hang together. So I had to try to find a way to uh, talk about the game uh, topically while also making sense chronologically. So I basically took the beginning of the game, um, you know, 1869, even though that's a little questionable, but um so 1869 to 1905. So uh, 1905 to 1912 is when the, the whole crisis was going on. Uh, but, you know, big changes in, in 1906. So that was the one breaking point. And then the second breaking point, um, I went with 1960. And, you know, you could argue that it could have been any, any time in that, in that period. But I use 1960 because that's when, uh, in my mind, the biggest change in football uh, from 1960 on is the influence of television and money. And that was when in, uh, ABC first or signed a contract where they brought in Rune Arledge and he, you know, he, he basically changed college football and the way we view it. He, you know, he just had tr- dramatic impacts. So that brought money, um, uh, money brought further specialization of coaches, um, you know, more money for the players. They could be full-time athletes, not part-time athletes, just all kinds of, I just think money has a massive impact. Um, and then that time coincided with, uh, you know, some changes in the game itself, as well as uh, really the true start of the desegregation of football. So that's kind of a, a key time period. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And again, uh, it's something that I didn't, I just took for granted uh, being a I grew up, I I was born in 85. So when I grew up, it was like I said, Barry Sanders, 89. And I just, everything from then on, when I was old enough, free agency was already here. So it was like fairly similar to how it is now, except for maybe the introduction of more news at you 24 seven. And then fantasy football really took off when the internet came on board. Other than that though, it was fairly similar. I mean, sure. We have the transition from more the running game to the passing game. And that kind of leads me to what were some of the elements of the game that now we maybe take for granted, but weren't even there in the early days. You know, I think clearly the, the forward pass is to me is the number one element um, in terms of, uh, you know, once you get past the initial years, the the forward pass is absolutely critical. And people, you know, even then, when it, when it first came about, it was it was heavily restricted. You know, you couldn't. There were rules about you couldn't uh, pass the ball unless you were five yards behind the line of scrimmage or five yards to the right or left. You couldn't throw it throw it more than five yards downfield. You couldn't uh, throw it into the end zone. Uh, which is why they didn't even, it wasn't even called the end zone yet. It was still called in goal. Uh, so they, you know, they had to adapt rules over time. So that's one of the things, I, I think the other one that, and I kind of talk about it as much in the epilogue of the book as, as during uh, the content, is just the, uh, the introduction of, of blocking. You know, we take, we just take it for granted that blocking has always been a part of the game, but when it came, you know, it came from rugby. It was rugby. When they first started the game here in, in America, they weren't planning to create a new sport. 
they were playing rugby and then they started tweaking it and in rugby you can't block and so for you know that really i think with all the cte and everything that that we focus on nowadays um i think the biggest the biggest thing that you know we we focused on tackling in terms of trying to address cte i really think blocking is where we have to go next. We have to find ways to reduce the amount of blocking in the game if we're going to address that part of that negative aspect of football. So is is that still the case in rugby? They cannot, they can't block down the field. Yeah, um, you know, the, the term offsides. You know, the origin of that is, you know, that you're in if you're in advance of the person with the ball, then you are offside and you cannot obstruct somebody else. If you're behind the person with the ball, then you are onside. And so, you know, all kinds of things and, you know, parts of the parts of this is in the book, but onside kicks, onside punts, all of those kinds of things, you know, we kind of explain them and the impact of what they first called interference, but it became what we call blocking. So running in, running in advance of, of the person with the ball and interfering with a defender. That w- that wasn't there when I was uh, when I was younger. I only played soccer. Well, we'll call it football, but as far as Americans go, soccer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one time in my life, and they kept calling me for offsides. I'm like, what is? I don't even know what this <laughs> means. I'm trying to go up there so you can kick me the ball. So I can. They stuck me on the defense. They called me the enforcer because let's just say I wasn't the fastest cat. So <laughs> I got a lot of those cards. I don't remember what color they were, but uh, it just it's amazing how things have transformed over again. Like you said, like blocking. It's like the fundamentals of football it's when you're in it if you don't if you can't block you can't do anything and back then like you said it was not even in existence and again this book is going to give anybody that wants to listen to it an in-depth look at all these various rules one thing i did see in there was the images of like it was funny how like they were holding that the ball and it was like they were well should we shot put it should we how do we throw a spiral and so like how did that transformation of you said passing was a big one how did that go so I think one of the misconceptions that um, most people have about football is so kind of everybody knows that in 1906, those forward pass became legal. And so it's not as if they didn't have forward passing before they had it a lot. It was just illegal. And, And by that, I mean, back then they called what we would call a lateral, they called a pass. So, um, if you if you read through newspaper articles about games from you know the 1880s up till you know through 1905, teams got penalized because they did a forward lateral, right? But it was really a forward, you know, what we they called it a forward pass. We would have called it a forward lateral, and so it was a part of the game. And so when they first approved legalized forward passing, they were thinking more along the lines of forward laterals, not the downfield overhead, you know, overhand spiral throw that we all know and love today, right? So in the first five, six years of football, most teams, you know, barely, barely use the for, the forward pass. They, they use technique wise, use kind of a basketball set shot, you know, two handed push. They flung it like a gr- grenade. They did all kinds of crazy things. Um, but there was this one guy, Bradbury Robert Robinson, who played at St. Louis U, who had learned how to throw the overhand spiral. Um, and he started using it. St. Louis U had tremendous success in the 1906 season. Uh, but, you know, they were out in St. Louis. They were out in the hinterlands for football. You know, back then, Eastern football was king. You know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, they were playing pretty good ball. But pretty much everybody else was kind of nothing. Um at least in terms of the you know Eastern press. And so they kind of got ignored. But over time, teams started picking it up and they were exposed to it. And you know, so a lot of people know of the story of Newt Rockney and, and uh, Notre Dame coming into Army in 1913 and executing forward passes like nobody out East had ever seen before. And so that kind of really popularized the type of approach uh, that came with the overhand, overhand spiral. Was that the photo that I saw? Because it showed specifically somebody throwing an overhand spiral. Yeah, that was that was uh, Robinson 
of St. Louis U. Uh, speak, going back to the photos, I mean, you have, normally you don't have this many photos in books. It was, it's very cool to see all these old time photos. How did you go about acquiring all these? Yeah. So uh, I think first off, just why do I have that many, right? So it, it's just, you know, I think there's a lot of things where when you go back, you know, I'm trying to describe h- how things worked back then. And, and so I, it's really being a translator. I'm trying to translate what was happening back then and put it into concepts that we understand today. And sometimes that's hard. Um, it's like certain languages, there's no direct translation for certain words. And so um, images became very helpful to illustrate that. So if I'm, ta- you know, I talk about nose guards. So before there were face masks, um, even before there were helmets, people had broken noses. How do you protect it? So they wore these things called nose guards. And they're hard to describe, but a picture pretty much tells you what they look like. So, you know, uh, so to find the things that I had trouble or just thought would be better communicated via image, I had, you know, plays and formations drawn up. You know, those were, but otherwise, I basically scanned university archives. I bought a fair number of old postcards. Um, back in the day before you know, Twitter and Facebook, people would get images of teams or you know, t- plays in action, things like that, print them off on postcard stock and mail them to their buddies. And so there's images out there that just you know, kind of illustrate certain concepts. So you know, I've got a got permissions from a lot of different universities and other kinds of museums and some, you know, individuals uh, to use images of of their teams in action or uh, whatever it may have been, stadiums, et cetera. One of them I saw was antiquefootball.com, and I kind of went over their website yesterday. How did you get in touch with them? You know, so I had come across, um, so Chris Horning uh, runs that site, and it's just a fabulous site. Uh, it's just got so much cool old stuff. And so, you know, I just reached out to him. I mean, it really when I, my, the early equipment information that I wrote was, you know, certainly heavily influenced by the information uh, from his site that was really, you know, kind of my key guiding path. Uh, he kind of stops after 1910, 1920. So everything else then, you know, I kind of had to go find on my own, I guess. Um but uh, so, you know, just reached out to him and said, hey, there's a couple of images that, you know, I'd like to be able to use. And, he, you know, he provided permission. So so that was nice. Very, you know, very thankful. Yeah, it's just I, I went to a site because of you and I, I looked at some of the cool rotating helmets that like, I guess you can call them helmets, <laughs> the protect protecting pads. And I saw the nose guard you're talking about. And what are what are some of the other elements that maybe someone like myself would go to a site like antique football and it's in your book, but I'm like, Whoa, I never knew this existed. Yeah. So there's just lots of things like, um, so the, you know, we think in terms of helmets early on, they, they wore nothing or they wore really headgear or they called them head harnesses oftentimes. And they were much more like, uh, more like a wrestling headgear, you know, kind of protected your ears from cauliflower ear, maybe some abrasions, you know, were avoided. But otherwise, really didn't offer you know much protection, and so a helmet is once you actually have a hard shell that kind of protects mechanically, you know, offers protection. So there's lots of, I mean, there's lots of cool stuff like that. Lots of images of, uh, you know, when the game was a bit more rugby oriented, uh, a lot of guys wore shin guards, which, you know, really doesn't happen too much anymore. The uh, you know, it just there's all kinds of. Well, in his case, he's got um, lots of information on shoulder pads, right? So that's one of those words that are a term that we don't really think much about. But the original shoulder pads really were just pads. You know, they were like leather. It was like an, a piece of upholstery or something. You know, stuffed leather or stuffed cloth that people sewed on the exterior of their jerseys on the shoulders. They sh- they sewed them on the sternum. They sh- sewed them on the elbows. Um, so. Shoulder pads were just pads on the shoulder. You know, n- nothing, no, there was no hard, you know, kind of mechanical protection to them. They were just, just pads. <laughs> yeah. One of those pads I saw was, um, can't remember if it was Rawlings or 
balding on his site, but it was just called somebody's football armor. And it was like this yeah. whole suit of armor. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think it was Whitby's or Whitney's because I've got that in the, you know, uh, that was one of the, one of the images that he offered uh, permission uh, to use. So that's in, in the book as well. And that kind of leads me to some of the, through your uh, findings and research and like that, they called things, and maybe it's just because it's a different era, but I just thought the romanticizing of the way they talked about everything, including sports, like Grantland Rice and, and people like that. Like, did you find any other, like the way that they explained rules and things like that, that just kind of stuck out in your mind? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think there was, uh, you know, football has always had this kind of machismo, <laughs> you know, the, the mano y mano thing. And, and, and frankly, that's, that's a really neat part of, of the game. Uh, but it's, uh, there was a much more of kind of the, you know, this whole thing about the, you know, the collegiate, you know, all American guy sort of thing. And so a lot of the early justification for football came from this thing called muscular Christianity. I'm not going to get into that, but much, but it, I mean, it's just the idea that, um, as America urbanized and more and more people had office jobs, there was this fear that they were becoming soft. And so athletics in general, and then football in particular, offered an, an opportunity for these young men from Harvard and Yale and wherever else uh, to go to battle without going to battle, right? Without really going to battle. So, um, you know, it helped people learn, you know, teamwork and um, how to, you know, be rough and tough and and strive and, and sacrifice and, you know, all, all, all kinds of things that are, are good and valuable, you know, traits or things to, to pursue, but it was, uh, you know, kind of the, some of the downside of football and the injuries, et cetera, were justified in part based on this kind of idea that, well, you know, you got to live to, you got to learn to, to be tough. Speaking of that same thing and going back to your fields of friendly strife, when I had that interview with Chris Serb, he kind of brought that up a little bit. Now, granted, he's not going to, he's not by any means saying football saved America for the war, but in a way it kind of that mentality, like you just said, kind of helped build us to get to that point, our troops, because they weren't necessarily prepared at the time. He said, I don't know that that much changed in some, in some respects in terms of, of, uh, you know, the, so there was a lot of conversation during both wars about high school athletics and, training young man, men and, and preparing their bodies and being healthier and, you know, those kinds of things. And so, um, so it, it was important, but I think it, during the, during world war one in particular, um, a lot of camps had kind of intramural leagues, both to entertain the guys at, you know, and then, you know, so each battalion might have, might have a team or each regiment had a team. And, um, but on the other, and then they also had an all-star team that represented the camp in competition against against other camps, and so those guys that was that was the same kind of PR as universities use their their athletic teams for. You know, it's, it was the same thing. You know, they were out showing how how tough and robust and athletic and good uh, the soldiers at this camp were, or the Marines at this you know at this base, etc. You know, etc. So it's it served moral purposes you know they thought athletics would keep them out of the the soldiers out of the red light district they thought um you know it just helped them become helped condition them etc um and then you know definitely the pr function was a big deal mm -hmm. and maybe some of that financial backing because they were out there seeing their boys fight in the on the gridiron i guess you could say then fighting overseas yeah exactly yeah so there were lots of um you know every as the war progressed and, you know, a lot, initially America wasn't really, wasn't involved at all. And then it took quite a while for a lot of Americans to actually get involved in the action. But, you know, sports pages always had an honor roll of area athletes who were wounded or killed in action or whatever, whatever may, may have happened. And, you know, we had the Spanish, Spanish flu going on at the same time. So that, you know, that influenced things during world war one, but yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, just played a, you know, it, it played this PR role and, you know, a lot of times the games were played either for 
charity purposes. You know, the gate went to charity or it went to fund athletic activities uh, in the camps. Right. Yeah. To be able to pay for what you're doing without having to take extra funds from Uncle Sam or something yeah. like that. That's right. That's right. And because of going through those two major wars and football had had a hard time at the beginning trying to survive, what were some of the changes in the game that you saw from World War I or World War II or both? Yeah, I think so. I think from World War I, probably more than anything, there's probably two things that affected football. One is it just kind of d- democratized the game. So there were high schools and playing football before World War I, but it just exposed a lot of young men to the game because they, they were exposed to it in camps and at a game much higher level than, than they had seen in their small farming community. Um, so I think World War I, the main impact was democratization. In World War II, um, it was unintended, but I think the biggest impact that the war had was uh, its impact on the substitution rules. So in 41, actually, before we got into the, before America got into the war, um, a lot of guys were getting drafted. They were concerned about uh, the limits, limited number of athletes on their rosters. And so they implemented a rule because before that, uh, you know, things varied a little bit, but fundamentally, once you left a game, you couldn't re-enter, or you couldn't re-enter until the beginning of the next quarter, or you know, whatever. You know, it varied from time to time. But basically, if you were in the game, you played the whole game, right? The, the sixty-minute man. And um, so, in forty-one, they decided, okay, we're going to allow for basically unlimited substitution. You can switch guys in and out. But when they did that, their intention was really just so that kind of the star of the team, if he got tired or banged up a little bit, you could pull him out, put somebody else in for a little bit, and then reinsert him when he got better. So they they expected it to be used in a very limited manner. And that's actually what happened until 1945. Uh, Michigan was playing Army, and Army was, you know, had two Heisman Trophy winners on the team, or future Heisman Trophy winners. Uh, So Michigan was just going to get demolished. And so Fritz Chrysler, the coach at Michigan at the time, decided to create an offensive unit and a defensive unit and shuffle them in and out. And he did that towards the end of the – it was either the last game or second last game of the season. Uh, And other people got wind of that and said, hey, this is a pretty good idea. And then, boom, you know, within three years, pretty much everybody was using – was substituting, you know, liberally. And then the colleges cut that back. Uh, in the fifties and returned to it really in the sixties full time. Uh, so I, you know, and I think the substitution rules have played as big a part in the change in football as uh, well, it's, it's in my top 11 changes in football is, you know, changes in, in, uh, in substitution rules, you know, cause it impacted, you know, everything we think about in terms of when you, when you had, when, when you expanded, when you went to, you know, kind of full substitution, you needed more players. So rosters expanded. You needed more coaches because you needed somebody coaching the offense and somebody coaching the defense. So coaches got more specialized. They thought longer and harder about just defense or just offense. They created more complex, more innovative schemes. The players got better. You were able to, you know, because of they, they could focus on specific things. Um, and then, you know, you, you also ended up with, uh, you know, the bodies of players changed because of the substitution rules. So a guy who in the past, if you were an end, you were an end. You had to play defensive end and offense, offensive end, right? So um, that was a different, potentially a different body type than when you start going with wide receivers and tight ends and defensive ends as really very different types of players. And it's just crazy how one little rule, really out of necessity, change and transform so many other things down the line. What are some of the other rules that maybe went away that we have no idea about that used to be back in early football history? Yeah. So, you know, one of them that doesn't go back that far, uh, but um, 
so when, you know, I started playing football in the, as a you know like grade schooler, and I guess it was the early seventies, something like that. And uh, at by that point, if you were an offensive lineman, if you put your hand in the dirt, it stayed there, right? Um, whereas that wasn't the case, you know, just even in the, that didn't come into being until the sixties. So prior to that, offensive linemen could put their hand down and then shift. And so they had these things called sucker shifts, which I talked about briefly and about just ways to kind of trick the defense and draw them offside by having your offensive line move laterally. Um, offensive linemen used to be able to go, run downfield, you know, on pass plays. So there were, there was no restriction on where, where the offensive line could be. And that was in the days when they didn't have, they didn't wear numbers and especially not what numbers on the front of their jerseys. Um, and before they numbered, before players were numbered so that centers had their number began with a five and guards with sixes and tackles with seven. So, Defenses could be very confused about who's an eligible receiver and who's not, um, especially if you know the offense has shifted formations in advance. So, it, and of course, the referees were or the officials were equally confused. <laughs> so, you know, so there's there's things like that that it's just the uh, the rules just have evolved. I, I think another one of my top eleven changes is the introduction of hash marks and. People are like, God, how could that be important? But you don't, you know, if you don't understand, you know, think about what football would be like without hash marks. So if you got tackled, or if a ball carrier is tackled a yard from the sideline, where does the next play start, right? Now we just, we know it goes into the hash mark. But back then it didn't. It stayed right there. If you were tackled a foot from the sideline, the ball started you know, the next play started there. And so teams had to, they, they, it was a regular part of practice in their playbooks. They had these unbalanced formations where the center was on the sideline and uh, play started from there. <laughs> so, I mean, it's one of those things that even like the, I've got two images in the book that show that. And even, you know, if you don't see the image, it's hard. It's really kind of hard to imagine that, you know, but it's, you know, you see these, everybody's over on one sideline because that's where they're snapping the ball. How did it work for field goals? Did they, so if they were tackled on the sideline, that's exactly where they had to try to kick it? Yeah, that's right. And so when you think about that, so an implication of of that is if, say you've got the ball on the 15, okay, and it's third down, what are your choices for trying to, uh, for trying to, you know, get a touchdown? So if you're at the 15, you don't want to be tackled out wide on a sweep because now you got to kick the field goal from the 15 yard line or whatever over near the sideline, right? So you have a terrible angle and it's a longer kick. So it, you know, without hash marks, it constrained play calling, even when you're in the middle of the field, at least, you know, if you were down in the red zone, right? So, you know, there's things like that, that, that just, you just don't realize or most people don't realize we're once part of the game, but they finally, you know, 1933 is when they introduced uh, the concept of hash marks. Uh, and it just dramatically changed the game. Yeah. My Detroit lions have a little bit to play with that, even though that's not what they were called at the time, huh? Well, so the, tell me, tell me the reference to the lions. Cause it, the Portsmouth Spartans and the Chicago bears. <laughs> I, I sometimes forget that uh, the Lions were, were from Portsmouth. So right, yes, right. <laughs> but you're exactly right. Um, so that it turned out that the the colleges were already talking about and had had recommended some rule changes. They'd recommended essentially the, uh, something along the lines of hash marks um, before that Chicago Bears game that ended up, and you know, Lions game that ended up being played indoors, which is why they ended up, you know, they had hockey boards there, you know, so they had to move the ball in away from the hockey boards in order to, uh, in order to play. Yeah. It's just like the Calvin Johnson pass. We always have to make real changes after the lions get screwed over because they had that <laughs> one where, what was the, uh, I can't remember. I think it was Bronco Nagurski throwing it to red Grange, but there That's was right. 
he wasn't five yards behind the lens. That's kind right. of crazy rules. I mean, that was something that changed at that point too, wasn't it? Like the whole behind the line of scrimmage? Yeah. So uh, up until that point, um, you couldn't throw a forward pass unless the passer was five yards behind the line of scrimmage. And so uh, there's controversy with Bronco Nagurski executing essentially what, what became a jump pass during that, that 1932 championship game. And so, um, so they changed the rule the next year. The, the NFL did. They changed it. 33 was the first year that the NFL did not use the college yearbook or not yearbook, rule book. So they went with the, they, they made the change. They, they created their own rule book. They moved the goalpost back onto the goal line. They allowed passing uh, from anywhere behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, and colleges didn't make that passing change until I want to say like 43 or it could have been 47. Um, but, you know, you think about that. And so if you can't pass from within the first five yards, then all of the quick passes in football, you know, all the little bubble screens, all those things disappear, right? The quick slants cannot be executed. You know, anything that's a three-step, maybe even a five-step drop, don't make any sense in, in, in that world. You you have to be, uh, you had to be five yards behind the line of scrimmage. So, yeah, the game changed as a re- result of a relatively simple rule. Yeah, it's crazy how things like that happen. I mean, I guess maybe Patrick Mahomes would have been like, yeah, bring it on kind of thing. But, uh, you know, some of these other quick quick uh, West Coast offense type styles. Uh, speaking of the field goal, I did see another photo, how you kind of broke down the play, the ice bowl game with Jerry Kramer's block and the change in that. How did that, how did that field goal post change impact that play? Oh man, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there with a cliffhanger for you. You're going to have to tune in next week to learn what the field goal post and the change had to do with the Green Bay Packers and Super Bowls and all these other things and the Ice Bowl. Who knows? Maybe there's a butterfly effect that could be taken if you go into back in time my DeLorean, you go back to that year in Canada and do something that might change some kind of outcome. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and leave that as your teaser bomb. For next week, you're going to have to tune in so you can hear that story and many more from Tim Brown and his book, How Football became football. And again, this reminds me, you got to head over to the Sports History Network, which is a collection of podcasts, shows, and bloggers dedicated to reliving and retelling some of the lost or forgotten sports stories from our yesteryear. You can do so by heading to sportshistorynetwork.com. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. Make sure you're the first to get the next episode. Please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.